Welcome to the wetlands of America. These robust ecosystems are home to some of the most fascinating plant and animal life. Mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, and amphibians all coexist in these habitats. And now, humankind has joined this complicated mix. The relationship we have with nature is of utmost importance. We gain so much from a healthy natural world and have a lot to lose if we put too much pressure on it. More than ever, the planet is in need of our help, and to do so, we must be knowledgeable and aware of our environment and those we share it with. Today our focus is on the salt marsh, found commonly in temperate regions around the world, including the southeastern United States, salt marshes form natural sanctuaries along the coastline. They are the buffers between rivers and oceans to our land, creating a habitat structure that is not only beneficial to our smaller critters, but our flora as well. The marsh's ability to support primary production plays a major part in the local food web. The salt marshes serve as a perfect place for tall grasses to thrive. Marsh grasses and photosynthesizing algae are the primary producers in this system. They form the foundation for all life in the wetlands. These plants and organisms absorb the sunlight, turning it into usable energy for themselves and the rest of the animals living in the marsh. This allows for other animals like fish, birds, amphibians, and insects to prosper. This common orb weaver spider has made itself a happy home within the marsh. Here she can relax and wait for her prey to waltz into her web. Here we see a bush cricket has fallen prey to her trap. The orb weaver doesn't even need to hunt. She can protect her eggs and catch dinner all in the same house. These systems have food everywhere, but don't be fooled by this gentle orb weaver. While this one has made her meal of a bush cricket, the larger orb weavers have been known to catch prey as big as frogs and small birds. Salt marshes are tidal, so they bring in all types of fish and aquatic life that would normally not make its way into terrestrial areas. These marshes are the convergence of two ecosystems, land and water. Their mutual cooperation provides a sanctuary for large birds like the eagles. The salt marshes allow for these raptors to find food easily while hanging out in the treetops. Our nation's bird has made her home in the marshes of St. Mary's County, Maryland. Here, she has all the food she can ask for. She not only has access to the fish, but to mammals and other water birds as well. The high winds and treetops give her lift and allow her to use little energy while searching for food below. She can spend time with her young and prepare them to take on the journey of leaving the nest. Here, she doesn't feel the threat of other birds. She reigns as queen. An abundance of food in salt marshes supports the cohabitation of many species. The home is happily shared with various water birds and other raptors. The American green tree frog also finds itself enjoying the bounty of the salt marshes. These little friends are found on the southeast coast, but have been seen as far inland as Texas. When we talk about tree frogs, most people think of the Amazon rainforest, but in actuality, they make their homes in many Americans' backyards. Dank atmospheric conditions seem to attract these frogs. Moist weather tends to host all kinds of bugs that are perfect for this amphibian's diet. Mosquitoes, flies, and other small insects can be found within the same ecosystem. The frogs also have a positive impact on human life. They keep the mosquito population down and help detect pollutants in the water. But this isn't the only way that the marshes help us. They help ease the land into the sea, which reduces erosion and flooding. They provide sanctuary for aquatic life like crabs and oysters. They provide us with plentiful fish for consumption. Along with this, the marshes give us recreational activities including kayaking, hunting, and hiking. This is only part of the reason why people must strive to protect these wetlands. However, our daily interactions have a heavy impact on the ecological communities, both good and bad. Our agricultural practices, waste disposal, urban and suburban development all have a devastating influence on the marshes. 
These interactions with the environment can cause climate change and rising tides, a problem which only grows more and more threatening with each day that we don't address it. But hope is not lost yet. We still have time. You can make a difference. One of the biggest threats facing our wetlands and our saltwater marshes is that of erosion. Erosion is the process by which soil and rock are gradually washed away by wind, water, and other naturally occurring processes. But don't let the word natural fool you, because humans can cause massively accelerated erosion. In the case of the wetlands, it stems from rising sea levels. Higher tides are now washing away at the shore and moving upwards, displacing animals from their natural habitat and predators from their natural prey. This is happening faster and faster as sea levels continue to rise. Now you may be asking yourself, why should I care? How does this affect me? Well, humans can be harmed by erosion as well. As sea levels rise and destroy the land, your coastal property goes along with it. Docks and houses have been washed away by the waves. Trees have been uprooted and they have a chance of destroying infrastructure. Entire communities have been forced to relocate due to erosion. All of these factors are reasons why we need to try and defend our ecosystem against erosion and rising tides. So what we have set up for you is a quick demonstration on how nature defends itself against erosion. In front of me, I have three bins, each representing a different type of shoreline. This first bin is filled with soil. Now, as I pour water into it, watch as the water flows through the soil and out the faucet, pulling particles along with it. As you can see, soil alone is not enough to withstand against water. Now let's move on to our next bin. This next bin is filled with soil, but held in place with rocks. Let's see how the soil holds up against my rising tides. As you can see, the water is still dirty, but less so than that of the first bin that was just filled with soil. That's because the rocks are protecting the soil and less is washing away. Now let's look at the final bin. Over in our final bin, we have soil again and some marsh grasses. Let's see how this combination holds up. Now look at that. The plants have prevented almost any soil from leaving the bin. That's because the intertwined roots of the marsh grasses have held the soil in place while letting some of the water through. Through their roots, grasses and other plants can help prevent erosion by holding the soil in place. Planting marsh grasses along a shoreline is a simple way that you can help prevent erosion. And the benefits of plants along a riverbank or shoreline don't end there. Plants such as marsh grasses act as filters for runoff water from farms or lawns. So if you have a shore in your backyard, or if you live near a river or lake, or even if you just want to protect your land, you can plant some grasses to not only save your property, but to save the creatures that enjoy it alongside you. Remember, rising sea levels is a human-caused occurrence. That means that together we can work to fix it. But time is short, and we need to act soon. And this isn't the only way you can help save your salt marshes. You, along with your community, can help reduce climate change. All it takes is a little scientific knowledge and some initiative. Biggest threats to marshes, that's, that's, a, that's a loaded question. Um... Naturally, climate change can be challenging for lots of ecosystems around the world. Where we see uh, water intruding into higher marsh areas, we see the marshes then retreating back into the forest line. And they'll experience uh, what's kind of called a squeeze phenomenon, where they run out of area to go into when the waters rise too much and the uh, marshes come up against forest line and have nowhere to go. Marshes are subject to sea level rise. Um, uh, as the sea level rises, um, marshes are susceptible to more wave energy, uh, more storminess in the bay, uh, inundation. But they're also great at mitigating the greenhouse gases that cause uh, global warming. Marshes, more than almost any other uh, uh, land cover, certainly more than forests, certainly more than fields, uh, can sequester carbon around the roots of the, the plants. 
marshes are more than just perceived swamps. They are places where life is thriving and not just the life that requires the marsh to survive, but us as people enjoying recreation opportunities in the marsh, just really engaging in it. I actually grew up in salt, you know, on the edge of a salt marsh. And to me, just the sound you hear out there, you know, it's, it's um, and it can be, a, it's a really peaceful place too, I think. So I think there's that, that benefit just for, almost for the soul, you know, when you get out there and you can just find that relaxing, peaceful place uh, just to unwind. You're out on the water, it's quiet, all you hear are the birds around you and the waves lapping. You see the sunrise over the marsh, these beautiful grasses just swaying in the wind, these tiny amazing birds making nests just in the grasses just over the water line. And you think like when, where else would I ever have this experience? Marshes are a really magical place for me. I've done a lot of kayaking through marshes and uh, walking up to my waist in the mud and smelling uh, the, the gases that come off of them, catching fish, watching birds, being bitten by mosquitoes and flies. Um, the whole experience is pretty amazing. Uh, it's that true transition between the land and the sea. I think that education is the absolute most important thing. Uh, education for kids, education for community members, and education for policymakers regulatory officials, anyone who can make some change. Education plays an, an enormous role in, in combating their loss. So the more people that we can reach with sharing how wonderful, how pristine, how valuable our wetlands are, it'll be our greatest tool for maintaining and preserving them into the future. You can have all the best scientists in the world that are studying marshes and wetlands and all the wonderful parts about them that make them so unique. But if that science isn't getting out to the people, if it's not getting out to the naturalists or the teachers or the students or those who are going to become the next wave of scientists, researchers, and champions for wetlands, then uh, we're going to be fighting a losing battle there.